This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. The Cosmic Computer by H. Beam Piper. Chapter 5 The meeting was at the Academy. When Khan and his father arrived, they found the central hall under the topside landing stage crowded. Kurt Fawzi and Professor Kelton had constituted themselves a reception committee. Franz Veltrin was in evidence with his audio-visual recorder, and Colonel Zareff was leaning on his silver-headed sword cane. Tom Brangwen in an unaccustomed best suit. Wade Lucas, among a group of merchants, arguing heatedly. Lorenzo Minardis, the distiller, and Lester Dawes, the banker, and Morgan Gatworth, the lawyer, talking to Judge Ledoux, about four times as many as had been in Fawzi's office the afternoon before. Finally, everybody was shepherded into a faculty conference room. There was a long table and a shorter one, tea-wise, at one end. Fawzi and Kelton conducted them to this. Both of them were trying to preside, Kelton because it was his academy, and Fawzi, ex officio as mayor and professional leading citizen, and because he had come to regard Merlin as his own private project. After everybody else was seated, the two rival chairman presumptive remained on their feet. Fawzi was saying, Let's come to order. We must conduct this meeting regularly. And Kelton was saying, Gentlemen, please, let me have your attention. If either of them took the chair, the other would resent it. Khan got to his feet again. "'Somebody will have to preside,' he said, loudly enough to cut through the babble at the long table. "'Would you take the chair, Judge Ledoux?' That stopped it. Neither of them wanted to contest the honor with the President Judge of the Gordon Valley Court. "'Excellent suggestion, Khan. Judge, will you preside?' Professor Kelton, who had seen himself losing out to Fawzi, asked. Fawzi threw one quick look around, estimated the situation, and got with it. "'Of course, Judge. You're the logical chairman. Here, will you sit here?' Judge Ledoux took the chair, looked around for something to use as a gavel, and rapped sharply with a paperweight. "'Young Mr. Con Maxwell, who has just returned from Terra, needs no introduction to any of you,' he began. Then, having established that, he took the next ten minutes to introduce Khan. When people began fidgeting, he wound up with, Now, only about a dozen of us were at the informal meeting in Mr. Fawzi's office yesterday. Khan, would you please repeat what you told us? Elaborate as you see fit. Khan rose. He talked briefly about his studies on Terra to qualify himself as an expert. Then he began describing the wealth of abandoned and still undiscovered Federation war material, and the many installations of which he had learned, careful to avoid giving clues to exact locations. The spaceport, the underground duplicate force command headquarters, the vast underground arsenals and shops and supply depots. Everybody was awed, even his father. He hadn't had time to tell him more than a fraction of it. Finally, somebody from the long table interrupted. "'Well, Con, how about Merlin? That's what we're interested in!' Wade Lucas snorted indignantly. "'He's telling you about real things, things worth millions of sols, and you want him to talk about that idiotic fantasy?' There was an angry outcry. Nobody actually shouted, "'To the stake with the blasphemer!' But that was the general idea." Judge Ledoux was rapping loudly for order. "'I don't know the exact location of Merlin,' Khan strove to make himself heard. "'The whole subject's classified top secret. But I am certain that Merlin exists, if not on Poitem, then somewhere in the Alpha System, and I am equally certain that we can find it.' Cheers! He waited for the hubbub to subside. Lucas was trying to yell above it. 
You admit you couldn't learn anything about this so-called Merlin, but you're still certain it exists. Why are you certain it doesn't? Why, the whole thing's absurdly fantastic. Maybe it is to a layman like you. I studied computers, and it isn't to me. Well, take all these elaborate preparations against space attack you were telling us about. I think Colonel Zareff here, who served in the Alliance Army, will bear me out that such an attack was plainly impossible. Zareff started to agree, then realized that he was aiding and comforting the enemy. Intelligence lag, he said. What do you expect, with General Headquarters thirty parsecs from the fighting? Yes, a computer can only process the data that's been taped into it, Khan said. That was a point he wanted to ram home, as forcibly and as often as possible. I suppose Merlin classified an alliance attack on Poitem as a low-order probability, but war is the province of chance. Clausewitz said that a thousand years ago. Fox Travis wasn't the sort of commander to let himself get caught, even by a very low-order probability. Well, how do you explain the absence, after forty years, of any mention in any history of the War of Merlin? How do you get around that? I don't have to. How do you get around it? Huh? Lucas was startled. Yes. Stories about Merlin were all over Poitem, all through the Third Force, even to the enemy. Say the stories were unfounded. Say Merlin never existed. Yet the belief in Merlin was an important historical fact, and no history of the war gives it so much as a footnote. He paused for effect, then continued. That can mean only one thing. Systematic suppression, backed by the whole force of the Terran Federation, a gigantic conspiracy of silence. Brother, if they swallowed that I have it made, they'll swallow anything. They did. All but Lucas. He banged his fist on the table. Now I've heard everything, he shouted in disgust. Not quite everything, doctor, Morgan Gatworth said. You will hear one of these days that we have found Merlin. Yes, that'll be the day. Lucas sprang to his feet, his chair toppling behind him. He shoved it aside with his foot. I'm not going to argue with you. Con Maxwell gave you a thousand-year-old quotation. I'll give you another, from Thomas Paine. To argue with those who have renounced the use and authority of reason is as futile as to administer medicine to the dead. I'll add this. Con Maxwell knows better than this balderdash he's been spouting to you. I don't know what his racket is, and I'm not staying to find out. You will, though, to your regret. He turned and strode from the room. There was a moment's silence after the door slammed behind him. Too bad, Khan thought. He would have made a good friend. Now he was going to make a very nasty enemy. Well, let's get to business, his father said. We don't want to argue about the existence of Merlin. We know that. Let's discuss the question of finding it. I still think it's somewhere off-planet, Lorenzo Menardis said. The moons of Pantagruel. Evidently, he'd read something, or seen an old film, about the moons of Pantagruel. No, that's too far. They'd keep it where they could use it. The old GHQ, Lester Dawes suggested. Suppose it's down under that, like the place Rodney found under Tenth Army. I hope not, Gatworth said. The planetary government took that over. Well, wherever it is, finding it is going to be expensive. Rodney Maxwell said. Now, to finance the search, I propose we use this information my son brought back from Terra. Dr. Lucas was right about one thing. That's worth millions of sols. Well, I propose also that we set up a company and get it chartered, a prospecting company, to operate under the Abandoned Property Act of 867. My son and I will contribute this information as our share in the capitalization of the company. The work of opening these Federation installations can go on concurrently with searching for Merlin, and profits can finance it. Silence for a moment, then a bedlam of cheering. Well, let's get organized, Gatworth said. 
What will we call this company? A number of voices shouted suggestions. Rodney Maxwell managed to get recognition and partial silence. It is of the first importance, he said, that we keep our real objective, Merlin, as close a secret as possible. The planetary government would like to get hold of it. And I leave you to ask yourselves how far Jake Vykoven and his cronies are to be trusted with anything like that, and I have no doubt the Federation might try to take it away from us. Couldn't do it, Rodney, Judge Ledoux objected. Everything the Federation abandoned in the Tri-System is public domain now. We have a Federation Supreme Court ruling. What's legality to the Federation? Clem Zareff demanded. They fought a criminally illegal war of aggression against my people. Down the table, somebody started singing, Rally round the banner, the banner black and green. Well, I think it's a good idea to keep quiet about it myself, Kurt Fawzi said. All right, Rodney Maxwell said. Then we don't want this company to sound like anything but another salvage company. I suggest we call it Litchfield Exploration and Salvage. Good name, Rodney, Dawes approved. That a motion? I second it. Unanimously carried. They had a name now, anyhow. Everybody began suggesting other topics for consideration. Capitalization, application for charter, election of officers, stock issues. Khan paid less and less attention. Industrial finance and organization wasn't his subject either. His father was plunging happily into it as though he had been promoting companies all his life. Khan sat and doodled with his six-color pen, mostly spherical hyperspace ships. We can't get all this cleared up now, Lester Dawes was protesting. Your Honor, I mean, Mr. Chairman, I suggest that committees be appointed. More hassling. Everybody wanted to be on all the committees. Finally, they appointed enough committees to include everybody. Well, that seems to be cleared up, Judge Ledoux said. I suggest a meeting day after tomorrow evening. The committee should have everything set up, and we should be able to organize ourselves and elect permanent officers. Is there anything else to discuss, or do I hear a motion to adjourn? Somebody thought they ought to have some idea of what the first operation would be. You heard me mention a spaceport, Khan said. I can tell you now that it's over on Barathrum, inside the crater of an extinct volcano. I think we ought to have a look at that, first of all. I know you seem to think that yesterday, that Merlin is off-planet, Fawzi said. I'm inclined to disagree, Khan. I think it's right here on Poitem. We ought to nail that spaceport down first, Khan argued. Khan, you mentioned an underground duplicate of Travis's general headquarters, Zareff said. They thought we'd possibly send a fleet here to blitz Poitem, or they wouldn't have built that. And this underground headquarters would be the safest place on the planet. They'd make sure of that. Staff brass don't like to get caught out in the rain, not when it's raining hellburners and planet busters. Merlin would be too big to take there along with them, so they'd put it there in the first place. That made sense. If he'd been Fox Travis, and if there had been a Merlin, that was exactly where he'd put it himself. But there was no Merlin, and he wanted a ship. He argued mulishly for a while, then saw that it was hopeless, and gave in. I want to find Merlin as much as any of you, he said. More! Merlin was the only thing I was trained for. We'll look there first. Somebody asked where, approximately, this underground force command headquarters was. Why, it's in the Badlands, over between the Blaubergs and the East Coast. Great goo! We'll need an army to go in there, Tom Brangwood said. That's where all these outlaws have been coming from, Blackie Perales and all. Then we'll get an army together, Clem Zarev said happily. Might make a little of that reward money that's been offered. We'll need more than that. We'll need excavation equipment and labor. Lots of labor, Khan said. It's a couple of hundred feet below the surface. From the plans, I'd say they just dug a big pit, built the headquarters in it, and filled it in. There are two entrances, a vertical shaft and a horizontal tunnel. 
When they pulled out, they probably filled the shaft and vitrified the rock at the outer ends, his father added. That was what they did at Tenth Army. Another idea hit him. Mr. Mayor, do you think you could set up some kind of a public works program here in Litchfield? We can't start this thing till after the wine pressing's over, and we'll need a lot of labor, as I pointed out. Now, it's important that we keep all our projects a secret until we can get our claims filed. If we start this municipal fix-up and clean-up program, we can give work to a lot of these drifters who haven't been able to get jobs on the plantations, get them organized into gangs, and keep them together till we're ready for the force command job. Lorenzo Minardis supported the idea. And while they were boondoggling around in Litchfield, we could pick out the best workers, get rid of the incompetents, and train a few supervisors. That's going to be one of our worst headaches, getting capable supervisors. You telling me? Rodney Maxwell asked. That was what I was wondering about, where we'd get gang bosses. And another thing, this municipal house cleaning would mask our real preparations. Well... We need something like that, Fozzie said. We've needed it for a long time. I guess it took Khan, coming home from Terra, to see how badly we've let the town get run down. Franz, suppose you and Tom Brangwen and Lorenzo form a committee on that. Look around, see what needs fixing up worst, and set up a project. Who's city engineer now? Abe O'Leary. He died six years ago, Dawes said. You never appointed his successor. Well, I guess I never got around to that, the mayor of Litchfield admitted. When the meeting finally adjourned, they went up and got in the car. His father lifted it straight up to 30,000 feet and started circling. An air car was one place where they could talk safely. Con, I was kind of worried down there. You were being a little too positive. You know, you're only twenty-three. As long as you agree with those people, you're a brilliant young man. You start getting ideas of your own, and you're just a half-baked kid. You let the older and wiser heads run things. You can't begin to hope to foul things up the way they can. Look at all the experience they've had. But we've got to have a ship. Everything depends on that. I know it does. We'll get a ship. Let Kurt Fawzi and Clem Zareff and the rest of them have this duplicate force command thing first, though. Keep them happy. As soon as we have that opened, you can take a gang and run over to Barathrum and grab your spaceport. Wait till they find out that Merlin isn't at force command duplicate. Then you can convince them that it's really on Koshai. Chapter 6 the car Rodney Maxwell got out of the hangar the next morning wasn't the one he and Khan had gone to the meeting in. It was the one he had flown in from 10th Army HQ at noon of the previous day. An Army reconnaissance job, slim and needle-like, completely enclosed, looking more like a missile than a vehicle, and armored in dazzling, iridescent collapsium. There was something to living on Poitem at that, only a millionaire on Terra could have owned a car like that. Nice, Khan said. Where did you dig it? Where we're going, Tenth Army. I'll bet she'll do Mach 3. Better than that. I've never had her above 2.5, but the airspeed gauge is marked up to 4. And she has everything. All kinds of detection instruments, cameras, audiovisual pickups, armament and the armor, you can take her through any kind of radiation. The armor was only a couple of micro-microns thick, but it would stop anything. It was collapsed matter. The electron shells of the atoms collapsed upon the nuclei, the atoms in actual contact. That plating made eighth-inch sheet steel as heavy as twelve-inch armor plate, and in texture and shielding properties, Lead was like sponge by comparison. They climbed in, and Rodney Maxwell snapped on the screens that served as windows. Khan leaned back and looked at the underside view in a screen on the roof of the car, as his father started the lift engine. 
Still think it's worth the price, son? his father asked. The price had begun to rise. Even so, he was afraid that what they had paid so far was only the down payment. Dinner last evening, Flora, who had evidently been talking to Wade Lucas, shouting accusations at them, his mother fleeing from the table in tears. As the car rose, he reached out and turned on and adjusted the telescreen for the underview. Keep your eye on that, father, he said. That's what we're paying to get rid of. A distillery, bigger than the Menardis plant, long closed and now half roofless and crumbling. Rows of warehouses, empty after the war, until taken over by homeless vagrants. Jerry built shanties with rattle-trap air cars grounded around them. Tramp Town, a festering sore on the south side of Litchfield. If we put this over, he continued, all those tramps will have steady work and good homes. We can have a park there, with fountains that'll work. Maybe even Flora and Mother will think we've done something worth doing. It'll be kind of hard to take in the meantime, though, but if you can take it, I can. Rodney Maxwell turned off the underside teleview screen and put on the forward one. See that little pink spot over there? Sunrise on the east side of Snagtooth. Tenth Army's just behind it. Now let's see if this airspeed gauge is telling the truth or just bragging. Sudden acceleration pushed them back in their seats. The calibrations on the gauge rose swiftly. The pink-lighted peak grew swiftly in the teleview screen. The gauge hadn't been bragging. It had been understating. The car had more speed than the instrument could register. Two and a half minutes from Litchfield, they were decelerating and swinging slowly around Snagtooth looking down on a tilted plateau that ended on the western side in a sheer drop of almost a thousand feet. There were ruinous buildings on it, barracks and storehouses and offices, an airship dock and an air traffic control tower from which all the glass had long ago vanished, a great steel telecast tower that had fallen, crushing a couple of buildings. Young trees had already grown among the wreckage. Look over there, on the slope below it. There's one entrance to the shelters. There was a clearing among the evergreens, half a mile from the buildings, and raw earth and a couple of big scows grounded nearby. They bulldozed rock and earth over the end of the tunnel. Then there's another one down on that bench, a couple of hundred feet below the edge of the plateau. They blasted rock down over that. The main entrance is a vertical shaft under the pre-stressed concrete dome. That was chapel, auditorium, or something. They just covered it with sheet metal and poured a foot of concrete on top. They floated down above the broken roofs and crumbling walls, and grounded in the area between the main administration building and the offices, back of the ship docks. Once, he supposed, it had been a lawn. Then it had been a jungle. Now it was a scuffed, littered, bare-trodden workyard. Men were straggling out of the administration building, lighting pipes and cigarettes. They all wore new but work-soiled infantry battle dress. All of them waved and shouted greetings. One, about Khan's own age, approached. As he got out, Khan saw the resemblance to Lester Dawes, the banker, before he recognized Ants Dawes who had been one of his closest friends six years ago. They shook hands and pounded each other on the back. "'Hey, you're looking great, Con. They all told him that. He'd begin to believe it pretty soon. "'Sorry I couldn't make the party, but somebody had to sit on the lid here, and Jerry Revis and I cut cards for it, and Jerry won.' "'You didn't tell me Ants was with you,' he reproached his father. Rodney Maxwell said he'd been saving that for a surprise. When Kahn asked Ants what was the matter with the bank, he said, For the birds! I'd as soon count sheets of toilet paper as this stuff we're using for money. Sooner! Toilet paper can be used for something, and this paper money's too stiff. Maybe some of this stuff we're digging here isn't worth much, 
but at least it's real. That was something else the Maxwell plan would have to take care of. Gresham's law was running hog-wild on Poitem. A planetary government sol was worth about ten centisols, Federation, and aside from deposit boxes, woolen socks under the mattress, and tin cans buried in the corner of the cellar, Federation currency was non-existent. "'Had breakfast yet?' Rodney Maxwell asked. "'Oh, hours ago. I was out and shot another spike-nose. It's hanging up back of the kitchen, waiting for the cook to skin it and cut it up.' He grinned at Khan. "'You don't get this kind of hunting in a bank, either.' Jerry still inside? I want to see him. Suppose you take Con around and show him the sights. And don't worry about him bumping you out of a job. Worry about the six or eight extra jobs you'll have to do beside your own from now on. Con and Ants crossed the yard and entered one of the office buildings through a big breach in the wall. Ants said, I did that myself. Ninety millimeter tank gun. When we want a wall out of the way, we get it out of the way. Inside were a lot of lifters and skids and power shovels and things. Laborers were assembling for work assignments. Most of them had been with his father six years ago, and he knew them. They hadn't done any growing up in the meantime. They climbed into an air jeep and floated out over the edge of the plateau, letting down past the sheer cliff to where the lower lateral shaft had been opened. A great deal of rock had been shoveled and bulldozed away to expose it. It was twenty feet high and forty wide. Ants simply steered the jeep inside and up the tunnel. There were occasional lights on at the ceiling. Ants said they were all powered from their own nuclear electric conversion units. We don't have the central power on here. There's a big mass energy converter, but we're tearing it down to ship out. That was something they could get a good price for, maybe even one-tenth of what it was worth. At least they wouldn't have to sell it by the ton. The tunnel ended in an enormous room a couple of hundred feet square and fifty high. There was a wide aisle up the middle. On either side, contragravity equipment was massed. Tanks with long ninety-millimeter guns, combat cars, small airboats, rank on rank of air cavalry single mounts, egg-shaped things just big enough for a man to sit in, with quadruple machine guns in front and flame jets behind. Ambulances armored against radiation, decontamination units, mobile workshops, mobile kitchens, troop carriers, jeeps, staff cars, power shovels, manipulators, lifters, all waiting for forty years to swarm out as soon as the bombs that never came stopped falling. They floated the jeep along hallways beyond and got down to look into rooms. Work was already going on in the power plant. A gang under a slim young man whom Ants introduced as Mohammed Matsui were using repair robots to get canisters of live plutonium out of a reactor. Workshops, laundries, storerooms, Kitchens, some stripped and a few still intact, a hospital, guardhouse, and lockup. More storerooms on the level above, reached by returning to the vehicle hangar and lifting to an upper entrance. By this time, gangs were at work there, too, moving contragravity skids in empty and out loaded. The CO here must have had squirrel blood, Ant said. I think when the evacuation orders came through, he just gathered up everything there was topside and crammed it down here, any old way. Honest to goo, this place was packed solid when we found it. Nobody'd believe it. Wait till you see the next one. You mean there's another place like this? You can say so. You can say a twenty-megaton thermonuclear is like a hand grenade, too. Ants Dawes simply didn't believe that. When they got back to the administration building on top, they found Rodney Maxwell, Jerry Rivas, the general foreman, and a half-dozen gang foremen in consultation. "'We're getting a hundred and fifty more men and ten farm scows from Litchfield,' his father said. "'Dave McCade's coming out from our yard, 
and Tom Brangwen sending one of his deputies to help boss them. We'll have to keep an eye on this crowd. They're all tramp-town hoodlums. That's the best we could get. We're going to have to get this place cleaned out in a hurry. We only have about two weeks till the wine-pressing's over, and then we want to start the next operation. Con, did you see all that engineering equipment down on the bottom level? Yes. I think we ought to leave a lot of that here. The shovels and bulldozers and manipulators and so forth. We can move it direct to force command. How are we fixed for blasting explosives? Name it, and we have it. Cataclysmite, FJ-7, anything you want. We'll need a lot of it. We're going to have to get a ship. I mean a contragravity ship, a freighter. First to move this stuff out of here, and then to move the stuff out of force command. And we want it mounted with heavy armament, too. We not only want a freighter, we want a fighting ship. You think so? I'm sure of it, Rodney Maxwell said. Where we're going is full of outlaws. There must be hundreds of them holding up over there. That's where all the trouble on the East Coast comes from. Now, outlaws are sure-thing players. They want to be alive to spend their loot, and they won't tackle anything that's too tough for them. A lot of guards and combat equipment may look like a loss on the books, but the books won't show how much of a loss you might take if you didn't have them. I want this operation armed till it'll be too much for all the outlaws on the planet to tackle. That made sense. It also made sense out of the billions of sols the Federation had spent preparing for an invasion that never came. If it had come and found them unprepared, the loss might have been the war itself. The scows and newly hired workers began arriving a little after noon. The scows had been borrowed from plantations where the crop had been gotten in. There were melon leaves and bits of vine in the bottoms. The workers were a bleary-eyed and unsavory lot. Khan had a suspicion, which Brangwen's deputy confirmed, that they had been collected by mass vagrancy arrests in Tramp Town. As soon as they started arriving, Jerry Revis hurried down to the old Provo Marshal's headquarters and came back with a lot of rubber billy clubs, which he issued to his gang bosses, regular and temporary. A few times they had to be used. By evening, however, the insubordinate and troublesome had been quieted. They would all steal anything they could put in their pockets, but that was to be expected. By evening, too, the contents of the underground treasure trove was moving out in a steady stream, and scows were shuttling to and from Litchfield. Rodney Maxfield was going back to town after lunch the next day. Khan wanted to know if he should go along. No, you stay here. Help keep things moving. Remember what I told you about the older and wiser heads? Let me handle them. I've been around them, heaven pity me, longer than you have. Just give me an audio-visual of your proxy, and I'll vote your stock. How much stock do I have, by the way? The same as I have. Ten thousand five hundred shares of common, at twenty centisols a share. But watch where it goes after we open force command. His father was back two days later to report. We're organized. Kurt Fozzie's president, of course, and does he love it. That'll keep him out of mischief. Dolph Kelton's secretary. He has an office force at the academy and can conscript students to help. He's organizing a research team from his seniors and post-grad students to work in the planetary library at Storacenda. There are a lot of old Third Force records there. He may find something useful. Of course, Lester Dawes is treasurer. What are you? Vice President in Charge of Operations. That's what I spent all yesterday log-rolling, baby-kissing, and cigar-passing to get. And what am I, if that's a fair question? You have a very distinguished position. You are a non-office-holding stockholder. The only other one is Judge Ledoux. As a member of the judiciary, he did not feel it proper to accept official position in a private corporation. Tom Brangwen's chief of company police, Clem Fawzi is commander of the company guards. 
and we have a law firm in Store Senda lined up to handle our charter application, Sturber Flynn and Chen Wong. Sturber is married to Jake Vykoven's sister. Flynn's son is married to the daughter of the Secretary of the Treasury, and Chen Wong is a nephew of the Chief Justice. All of them are directly descended from members of Genji Gartner's original crew. You don't anticipate any trouble about getting the charter? Not exactly. And Lester Dawes is in store Senda now, trying to find us a contragravity ship. There are about a dozen in the hands of receivers for bankrupt shipping companies. He might find one that's still airworthy. Oh, you remember how I insisted on absolute secrecy about our Merlin objective? That's working out better than my fondest expectations. It's leaking like a machine-gunned water tank, and everybody it leaks to is positive that we know exactly where Merlin is, or we wouldn't be trying to keep it a secret. Three days later, Khan hitched a ride on a freight scow to Litchfield. From the air, he could see a haze of bonfire smoke over High Garden Terrace, and a gang of men at work. There were more men at work on the mall and along the streets on either side. He went up from the yard below the house, where the scow was being unloaded, and found his mother in the living room, watching a screenplay with one eye and keeping the other on a soulless machine like a miniature contragravity tank, which was going over the carpet with a vacuum cleaner and taking swipes at the furniture with a rotary dust mop. She was glad to see him, and then became troubled. Con, when Flora comes home, you won't argue with her, will you? Only in self-defense. That was the wrong thing to say. He changed it to, no, I won't argue with her at all. And then quoted Wade Lucas, quoting Thomas Paine. Then he had to assure his mother a couple of times that there really was a Merlin, and then assure her that it wouldn't get loose and hurt anybody if he did find it. In the middle of his assurances about the harmlessness of Merlin, the house-cleaning robot began knocking things off the top of a table. "'Oscar, you stop that!' his mother yelled. Oscar, deaf as the adder, kept on. Khan yelled at his mother to use her control. She remembered that she had one, a thing like an old-fashioned pocket watch, around her neck on a chain, and got the robot stopped. No wonder she was afraid of Merlin. He took advantage of the interruption to get to his room and change clothes, then went up to the hangar and got out an air cavalry mount. About fifty men were working on High Garden Terrace, pruning and trimming and leveling the lawns. There was a big vitrifier on the mall. Even at five hundred feet he could feel the heat from it, chuffing and clanking and pouring lava-like molten rock for a new pavement. And all the nymphs and satyrs and dryads and fauns and centaurs had had their pedestals rebuilt and were sandblasted clean. He landed on the top of the airline's building and rode a lift down to the office where Kurt Fawzi neglected the affairs of his shipline agency, his brokerage business, and the city of Litchfield. The afternoon habitués had begun to gather. Raymond Fitch, the used vehicles dealer, Lorenzo Menardis, Judge Ledoux, Tom Brangwen, Clem Zareff. Fawzi was on the screen talking to somebody with sandy hair and a suit that didn't seem to be made of any sort of Federation Armed Forces material about warehouse facilities. The addresses they were mentioning were in store Senda. "'No, Leo, I don't know when,' Fawzi was saying. "'But don't you worry. You just have space for it, and we'll fill it up. And don't ask me what sort of stuff. You know what a salvage operation's like.' You just haul out the stuff as you come to it. Tom Brangwen, lounging in one of the deep chairs, looked up. Hello, Con. We're having a time. Another two hundred tramps came in on the Countess this morning, and Goo only knows how many in their own vehicles, and they all seem to think if there's work for some, there ought to be work for all, and some of them are getting nasty. We can use some more out at the dig. The ones you sent out Thursday are doing all right, once they found out we weren't taking any foolishness." Fawzi turned away from the screen. "'Well, Con, we're in,' he said. "'The charter was granted this morning. 
Now we're Litchfield Exploration and Salvage Limited. And Lester Dawes has found us a contragravity ship. How much will it cost us? Fozzie began to laugh. Con, this'll slay you. She isn't costing us a centisol. You know those old ships on Mothball Row, back of the old West End ship docks at Storacenda? Con nodded. He'd seen them before he had gone away, and from the city of Asgard coming in. A lot of old army transport craft, covered with muslin and sprayed with protectoplast. The planetary government had taken them over after the war and forgotten them. Well, Lester's gotten one of them for us under the old 878 Commercial Enterprise Encouragement Act. She's an army combat freighter, regimental ammunition ship. Of course, she still has armament. We'll have to pay to get that off. Why? Fozzie looked at him in surprise. It would only be in the way and add weight. We want it for a cargo ship, don't we? That was what she was built for. What kind of armament? Fozzie didn't know. Clem Zareff did. Four hundred and fifteen millimeter rifles, two four and two aft, a pair of lift and drive missile launchers amidships, and a secondary gun battery of seventy millimeters and fifty millimeter auto cannon. I know the class. We captured a few of them. Good ships. Fozzie was horrified. Why, that's more firepower than the whole air patrol. Look, the government won't like our having anything like that. They're giving her to us, aren't they? Menardis asked. Gehenna with what the government likes, the old rebel swore. If they'd put a few of those ships into commission, they could wipe out these outlaws, and a private company would need an armed ship. May I use your screen, Kurt? Con asked. When Fozzie nodded, he punched out the combination of the operating office at Tenth Army, and finally got his father on. He told him about the ship. There's talk about tearing the armament out, he added. Is that so now? Well, I'll call Lester Dawes before he can get started on it. I think I'll go into Storacenda tomorrow and see the ship for myself. See what I can do about ammunition for those guns, too. But, Rod, Fozzie protested, joining the conversation, we don't want to start a war. No, we want to stay out of one. You don't do that by disarming. We're taking that ship down into the Badlands, remember? Rodney Maxwell said. Ever hear the name Blackie Paralis? Fozzie had. He stopped arguing about armament. Instead, he began worrying about how much the civic cleanup campaign was costing Litchfield. You think we really need that, Rod? Of course we do. You'd be surprised how much labor we're going to need, and how hard up we're going to be for capable supervisors. This thing's a training program, Kurt, and we'll need every man we train on it. But it's costing like Niflheim, Rod. We're going to bankrupt the city. Worse than it is now, you mean? Oh, don't worry, Kurt. As soon as we find Merlin, everything will be all right. France Veltrin came in shortly after Rodney Maxwell was off the screen. He dropped his audiovisual camera and sound recorder on the table, laid his pistol belt on top of them, and took a drink of brandy, downing it with the audible satisfaction of a thirsty horse at a trough. Then he looked around accusingly. "'Somebody's been talking,' he declared. "'I've had all the news services on the planet on my screen today. They all want the story about what's happening here. They've heard we know where Merlin is, that Con Maxwell found out on Terra. They just put two and two together and threw seven, Con said. A Herald Guardian ship news reporter interviewed me when I got in, and found out I'd been studying cybernetics and computer theory on Terra. What did you tell them? Complete denial. We don't know a thing about Merlin. Naturally, they didn't believe me. A bunch of them are coming out here tomorrow. What are we going to tell them? We'll all have to have the same story. I, said Judge Ledoux, am not going to be interviewed. I am leaving town till they're gone. Why don't you steer them on to Wade Lucas? Con asked. 
If you want anything denied, he'll do it for you." Everybody thought that was a wonderful idea, except Clem Zareff, and he waited until Khan was ready to go and rode up to the landing stage with him. Khan, I know this Lucas is going to marry your sister, he began, but how much do you know about him? Not much. He seems like a nice chap. I don't hold what he said at the meeting against him. I suppose if I'd come from off-planet, I wouldn't believe in Merlin either. Ha! But doesn't he believe in Merlin? He makes noises like it. You know what I think? Clem Zareff lowered his voice to a whisper. I think he's a Federation spy. I think the Federation's lost Merlin. That's why they haven't come back to get it long ago. Pretty big thing to mislay. It could happen. There'd only be a few scientists and some high-staff officials who'd know where it was. Well, say they all went back to Terra on the same ship, and the ship was lost at space. Sabotage. One of our commerce raiders that hadn't heard the war was over. Maybe just an ordinary accident. But the ship's lost, and the location of Merlin's lost with her. That could happen. Khan agreed seriously. All right. So ever since they've had people here, listening, watching, spying. This Lucas, he showed up here about a year after you went to Terra. And who does he get engaged to? Your sister. And what does she do here? Goes around arguing that there is no Merlin, getting people to argue with him, getting them mad so they'll blurt out anything they know. I'm an old field officer. I know all the prisoner interrogation tricks in the book, and that's always been one of the best." Then why did he act the way he did at the meeting? All he did was cut himself off from learning anything more from any of us. In his place, would you have done that? No. You would have tried to take the lead in hunting for Merlin yourself, now wouldn't you?" Zareph was silent, first puzzled and then hurt. Now he would have to tear the whole idea down and build it over. Flora was quite friendly when she came home from school. She'd found out, somewhere, that Khan had been the originator of the municipal facelifting project. He was tempted, briefly, to tell her a little, if not all, of the truth about the Maxwell plan, then decided against it. The way to keep a secret was to confide it to nobody. Every time you did, you doubled, maybe even squared, the chances of exposure. He told his father, when Rodney Maxwell came in from the dig, about his talk with Clem Zareff. How long's he been like that, anyhow? he asked. As long as I've known him. When it comes to melons and wine and bossing tramp labor and taking care of his money and coming in out of the rain, Clem Zareff's as sane as I am. But on the subject of the Terran Federation, he's crazy as a bedbug. What is a bedbug, anyhow? They have them on Terra, in places like Tramptown. They have places like Tramptown on Terra, too. Uh huh. I suppose, in Clem's boots, I'd be just as crazy as he is, Rodney Maxwell said. One minute, he had a wife and two children in Kindleburg on Ashmodai, and the next minute, Kindleberg was a puddle of radioactive slag. That was in 51, wasn't it? I read about it, Khan said. It was a famous victory. That was from a poem, too. Rodney Maxwell flew to Storsenda early the next morning. Khan rode back to Tenth Army on an empty scow, and pitched into the job of getting the stores and equipment out of the underground shelters. More farm tramps arrived, and had to be pounded into obedience and taught the work. At the same time, Litchfield was getting a steady influx of job-seekers, and a secondary swarm of thugs, grifters, and gangsters who followed them. Clem Zareff, having gotten all his melons pressed, came out to Tenth Army, where he selected fifty of the best men from the work gangs, and began drilling them as soldiers to guard the next operation. The manual of arms, 
drill and salute he taught them was, of course, System States Alliance. A week later, the ship arrived from Storacenda. A hundred and sixty feet, three thousand tons, small enough to be berthed inside a hyperspace transport, and fast enough to get a load of ammunition to troops at the front, unload, and get out again before the enemy could zero in on her, and armed to fight off any Army Air Force combat craft. The delay had been in recruiting officers and crew. The captain and chief engineer were out-of-work shipline officers. The gunner was a former Federation artillery officer, and the crew looked more like pirates than most pirates did. They christened her the Lester Dawes, because Dawes had secured her and because the name began with the initials of Litchfield Exploration and Salvage. From then on, it was a race to see whether the Tenth Army attack shelters would be empty before the wine was all pressed, or vice versa. End of chapter 6